Um, we're not going to hear from Ninja, but close cosmologies of two dimensional graphs. So hello everyone. So first I want to thank the organizer for letting me be here and it's really great to be back. And uh, today I'll talk about closed cosmologies in two dimensional gravity. And uh, this is some work in progress with together with Misha Yusachu and Zhiyue Wang. And both of them are in the audience. So if there's anything in my talk that's unclear, you can ask them afterwards. So first, uh, some background motivation. <laughs> During the past decades, we learned a lot about quantum gravity through ADS-CFG duality. And uh, there have been much progress in understanding of black holes. But the, however, the universe we live in may not have a boundary. It also has a positive cosmological constant and is more similar to the theta space. Uh, okay. However, studying the theta space is hard. And uh, what we will do is that we will take one step back and study ADS cosmology. I mean, close the universes with negative cosmological constant. They might be easier to study due to our understanding of ADS CFT. We would like to explore universes without boundaries. They are very, well, as we'll see, they are very different from space times with boundaries, like asymptotically anti deciduous or flat space time. We will study simple toy models into the two dimensions where calculations are easier and a lot of physics have already been understood. We will see that there are stark contrasts as well as connections between the semi-classical and the non-perturbative aspect of the theory of closed universes. So there have been a lot of inspiring works in similar directions in the uh, past couple of years. This is just uh, a partial list of, uh, partial list of them. And uh, special thanks to Mark Van Ramstunk. I think Misha spoke with him and uh, that uh, gave us the initial motivation for this work. So here's the outline of the talk. First, I will uh, show you how to construct closed universes in JT gravity, plus matter. More, more. And uh, then we will study perturbative gravity in JT closed universes. Then we study non-perturbative physics in a simple topological model. At the end, I will point out future directions and unanswered questions. So first, construction of closed universes in JT gravity. Uh, I assume that most of the audience will be familiar with this. And here is the Euclidean action of JT gravity. There is a bulk term, there is a boundary term, there's topological term plus matter. And uh, uh, if you put uh, this R equal to minus two, then the boundary term reduced to a Schwarzian term. This C is a coupling constant of Schwarzian we will use later. And in particular, see that there is a topological term here. And the one solution in this theory is this kind of a double trumpet. I mean, this is not exactly accurate. We, we need some matter, but roughly speaking, let's say the double trumpet geometry. And uh, here's the metric. Let's say rho is this direction. Rho goes from negative infinity to plus infinity in this direction. And there's also a direction sigma, which is this uh, uh, transverse circular direction. And this circular direction can be, let's say, any uh, can, can, can be any positive number. So sigma is uh, identified with the sigma plus b. And uh, it's a well-known observation from Madacena and Mouse that uh, analytic continuation of this double trumpet geometry gives rise to FRW cosmology. And uh, this is a closed universe with no boundaries. So here's what, what we mean. Start from a double trumpet like this. Then you let rho goes to it. What you will get is that a closed universe like, like, like this. There is a, a big bang and a big crunch singularity. Uh, notice that one feature is that this time is actually finite. The proper time is finite. And uh, let's make analogy with uh, the case of eternal black hole. Let's say in internal black hole, we can have a half a Euclidean disk. Then we do an analytic continuation after this slice then we will get a, a eternal black hole. And similarly here, we have a half a double trumpet. And after this slice, you'll go to uh, Lorentzian time, then you'll get a, a, a close the universe, FRW close the universe. So we, we claim that we can prepare closed universe state this way. So what do we mean by preparing a state? Let's first look at the black hole case. In the black hole case, what we have is that we will have wave functional on this uh, spatial geometry. 
And its saddle configuration will be an eternal black hole with temperature one over beta. So, and if you look at this quantity, basically it's just you complete this entire circle, then it will compute norm square of this state. Similarly, for the closed universe case, let's consider this quantity. So this is a trace e to the minus beta h with some operator. We choose the operator O such that it's one point fun function vanishes. You will see later that why we require the one point function vanishes. And what we will get is a, we will get a wave functional on closed the geometries. And in this case, the leading saddle corresponds to closed universe of size D. So the reason we want one point function to vanish is because we want to kill the disk saddle. And that's why the, it's a, the leading saddle is some closed universe of certain size. And also you can just uh, complete this entire double trumpet and this thing gives norm square of this state. Okay, so we get different, let's say we can have a, a tons of different initial conditions, boundary conditions. So it looks like we get different wave functionals with different boundary conditions. And we will consider them as different states of this closed universe. So in this sense, we specify a state by specifying a, a Euclidean boundary condition. I would like to make analogy, let's say with the case of thermal field double, you have a boundary conditions here, you specify a state, here we specify a state by doing something like this. And one can ask semi-classically, how many closed universe states do we have? The short answer is that there is a lot. More specifically, we can construct a large number of orthogonal semi-classical states as follows. Let's say, imagine, you, it's a, the rough idea is that you can have a quite different boundary conditions. For example, you can choose different operators, OI, OJ, such that uh, these two just the, the overlap would just be zero. And, uh, in particular, you can consider this matrix M is defined as the inner product of these two states and the, the, the rank of M will be large. And uh, then let's look at perturbative gravity in closed the universes, let's say in JT plus matter. So what, what do we want to do? We want to construct the trustworthy semi-classical solutions of a closed universe from asymptotic boundary conditions. Uh, here's, here will be our approach. We first uh, solve for Euclidean actions from uh, some asymptotic boundary conditions. Basically, we set the boundary conditions here and uh, we construct a Euclidean solution like this. Now we cut it in half. So we look at the time reflection symmetric slice and we analytically continue to Lorentzian solution. And so we get a closed universe solution. Uh, there is an issue here that in JT plus matter, and there will be no classical solution without matter. So we need to include some matter to stabilize the wormhole. And uh, let's look at a particular example. We assume we have a heavy operator with a, with a large mass. Okay, the reason I want a large mass is because I want to have a large closed universe. So I can do semi-classical physics in it, with the, which is more trustworthy. Now, now let's uh, consider, let's say this quantity. Uh, we want to, we, we look for geometry like this, where boundary condition is that there's, this is the length of the boundary. This is the dilaton value at the boundary. And in order to solve for this geometry, we'll follow some uh, uh, approach by Douglas Stanford is that you can cut it open somewhere and put this on ADS disk, the solve for geometry here. And then you do analytical continuation on this disk. Or you can cut it in some other way. Let's say you cut it open, instead of cut it here, you cut it along this word line of this particle, then you get a geometry like this. So it's a, this, this blue line is a word line of the particle, and this blue line is also a word line of the same particle, and they will be identified. So the, the reason I draw it in, in this coordinate is because in this coordinates, it's easy to write down a solution. The solution is just something like this, as you already saw before where sigma has a certain range. This range will be de determined dynamically by these uh, initial conditions. And uh, we also, just to make sure that uh, we are doing something sensible, we work out the dilaton value. So here I have a wiggle, I have approximate signs here is uh, because I want to write things down in compact and simple ways. We do have the full solution. We do have uh, exact solutions, and, but uh, it just uh, certain parameters will be solutions of some algebraic equations. So in this case, there's a, uh, and notice that uh, in this geometry, the dilaton value is continuous across the location of this particle, but its derivative will jump. 
and the derivative of the derivative gives the stress energy tensor of this uh, particle. And, oh, by the way, in this picture, there are these uh, light gray lines. They are actually lines of constant dilaton, just for you to visualize that. Uh, oh, the reason we call this land B0, oh, this should be B0. The reason we call this B0 is we consider this as, as empty closed universe solution. Why? Because this is basically as empty as it could possibly be. It's, uh, you need uh, something to stabilize the, the solution. And from another perspective, this thing also, uh, I hope it uh, can play a good role as observer or clock. So, I mean, if we have empty solution, then we can add perturbations. Let's again, look at start from Euclidean circle. We have something here. This is what we have before. Then we can add another light perturbation with mass M2, which is much smaller and we can move it around. And just by similar techniques, you can work out the solution and you get a, a uh, a Lorentzian solution like this. This is a closed universe with two particles sitting there, one heavy, one light. And you can work out how the length, uh, how the, the size, again, the size of the universe will be determined dynamically. And one, one curious feature is the following that in this setup, let's say we, if we fix the total length to be beta and uh, we move this uh, light uh, particle relative to this heavy particle, as we move it around, the size of the universe will change because the size of the universe in this case is really dynamical. So let's make, do some summary of a perturbative physics so far. So we've seen that states are labeled by boundary conditions like this, and the different boundary conditions gives rise to different wave functionals. And so we have states. Next, next we consider operators. One can clearly consider operators that change the state. Say we add an additional operator here that will change the boundary conditions, hence change the functional, and we consider it as a natural way to change the state. But can we talk about bulk operators? Maybe. Maybe we can do something similar to HKLL. So what I had in mind is maybe we can express operators, let's say something like this, first uh, to some smeared operator on this slice. And, uh, and then we just uh, express the operator here as smeared operators on this boundary. Uh, of course, one need to be careful about operator dressing, this kind of thing. Such operators, if exist, are only defined on a particular semi-classical background. Uh, this aspect is similar to the case of ADS-CFT. So there are a lot more to do about the, I mean, this is work in progress, still a lot more to do about perturbative physics. One could discuss relational observables, emergent time, symmetry generators, et cetera. Now, I would like to move to non-perturbative physics. In order to study non-perturbative physics, we'll go back to a much simpler model, which is a topological model. And this model is uh, motivated by uh, this work of Morov and Maxfield. So first, we again label the state by initial conditions. But uh, the state will be really simple. It's just a circle plus, uh, uh, plus a dot. A dot has a, this, is a, this dot has a flavor index, which we call it I. And this is motivated by this earlier quantity, trace e to, the e to the minus beta h o i. And action, the action will be just the topological term plus matter term. And uh, for this matter term, the rule is that uh, this flavor in, in, uh, indices i, they have to pair up, otherwise it gives zero. And uh, this is motivated by the earlier condition that uh, trace e to the minus beta h o is zero. And uh, we, Again, consider this large matrix Mij, which is psi i such. By the way, k is the number of the flavors. And uh, this inner product is given by just the two circles with the different boundary conditions. And what we will do is that we will study all moments of this matrix M. Uh, let's first just look at a couple of, uh, to warm up, let's just look at a couple of simple examples. So first, uh, let's just look at just psi i psi j to leading order. It's uh, leading order is given by delta i j. And when these two are the same, you have a cylinder. The, the, the flavor indices pair up, and then you have a cylinder, you just get delta i j. And when, the, when i is not equal to j, to leading order, it vanishes. You need to consider next order. So you look at its square. Uh, when you square it, you have a, uh, two pairs of them, and they can pair up in this way at the end of the day. And here's the answer you get. 
And here, once you see the answer, it should already ring an alarm. The reason is that this answer is actually comparable to the earlier answer. This answer is comparable to the diagonal term. Let's look at what happens with the black hole case. Let's say we have end of world brains with black holes with flavor I here. And so this is asymptotic boundary. This is just the, the end of world brain. And we can do similar calculations in black hole case. We look at the inner product, it's controlled by a doubt function. And for, for different flavors, we can look at the square of inner product, we get some answer. However, for the black hole case, this answer is exponentially suppressed comparing with the leading answer. Yeah. 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 In, uh, a flavor carried by the having matter that sustains yes. the, the yes. black hole, or should I think as some additional insertion of a predator? Uh, here, I'm just, because this topological model, I'm just thinking end of world brains. Yes, you can, you can think about that, yeah. So what we see is that in this case, we expect large corrections from space-time wormholes. This was actually sort of, a, this is the first thing we noticed in, in this work, and it surprised us. We expect that will be something that's quite different. And uh, let's say if we want to know the rank of matrix M, uh, there is a quite general argument, which is uh, basically adapted from an argument, from, the, uh, from argument in the West Coast model. It's not exactly the same, but the, the mathematics is basically identical. So let's go back to our construction. Here's the state psi i, and here's inner product psi i, psi j. So let's uh, look at the example trace m, take the trace, then take uh, the third power. Here's the boundary condition. We have trace m, trace m, trace m, and three of them. You'll notice that the second row is the same as the first row. Or we can first take the third power of M, then we take the trace. So we have I, J, J, K, K, I. And in this case, the second row is a permutation of the first row. And so what we see is that in these two quantities, the boundary conditions are actually the same. So we conclude that these two quantities are the same. And the same argument will lead to the conclusion that for arbitrary N, these two quantities are the same. So we conclude that the rank of M is one, what is this? Okay. So including the effect of space-time wormholes, the dimension of Hilbert space is one. There's only one closed universe state in each alpha sector. And in comparison, you, want, you may want to ask why this didn't happen in black hole case. So here's the black hole case. Again, we have black holes with end of world brain. There, there is an end of world brain flavor index I and we have asymptotic boundary. And when we take in a product, we connect this asymptotic boundary, we have something like this. So let's look at the same quantity. If we first take the trace, then take the uh, third power, here's what we get. And uh, if we first take the third power, then we take trace. This is I, J, J, K, K, I. We get something like this. And you notice that the boundary conditions for the above two quantities are actually different. So if you compare this with this black hole case and earlier closed universe case, you see that the key difference is that closed universes don't have asymptotic boundaries. Because in these above computations, asymptotic boundaries are connected in specific ways, while any bulk connections are allowed. So we conclude that the matrix M has only one eigenvalue, which is given by, just given by its trace. And this is the norm square of this closed universe state. Of course, it's unnormalized. And uh, we just uh, try to work out the distribution of this number. I mean, we only get one number for each state. Let's just try to work out the distribution of this number. Uh, we first uh, set this uh, topological term to just uh, to, to ignore this topological term. And, uh, and we assume that uh, uh, because Daniel told us that uh, it's the closed universe states are real. So let's assume the states are real. So bras and cats are connected to each other. And uh, what we got is uh, just uh, is a, uh, Where's the vertical axis? Is it here? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's vaguely here. So we get uh, some distribution of this uh, trace m over k. So this is, uh, this is now trace m, trace m over k just to, to, to normalize it. And uh, you had the different values of, uh, of, uh, of k. Basically, it's the, the larger the flavor is, the sharper it will be picked around one. And uh, we will call this distribution p of infinity as it will uh, show up later. 
And uh, the distribution is over different alpha sectors. And each alpha sector has one closed universe state with certain value of norm. I mean, this was taught to me by Don Morrow. At first, we were very confused what's this distribution over until he explained it to us. And here's a simple way to understand this distribution. And people may not be familiar with, uh, let's say, chi-square, but I'm sure everyone is familiar with the uh, Gaussian uh, normal distribution. Let's say when this thing is infinity, then having circular boundaries no longer play any roles. Instead, we can, re we can represent each state by a zero dimensional dot carrying flavor index i. So here's what we mean. The state we just labeled by something, a dot, inner product has two dots. We will call this dot model. This is as simple as possible. It's even simpler than by more of max field. And uh, the inner product is computed this way. It's uh, just by this kind of rules. No higher topology is possible. And uh, we associate to each state i a number, capital AI. And it turns out that these AIs are independent Gaussian random variables with zero mean and variance y. And uh, the, the conclusion is that uh, the distribution we find is the following. This matrix M, the inner product matrix, is nothing about AI AJ. And uh, when we write it this way, we claim that this equality is an equality between random variables. So the left-hand side is random variable, the right-hand side is also random variables. Basically, all moments are the same because the distributions are the same. And this naive dot model is the analog of matter sector. So when we made up this model, what we had in mind is uh, the matter sector in JT plus matter. Another thing to keep in mind is that uh, we notice a trace of this thing, sum over I A R squared. This is actually counts roughly the dimension of this, uh, this, uh, this sector, this dot model sector. And now we include the higher topology effects. We now assume that e to the 2s naught is finite. So I will spare you with all the uh, annoying combinatorics. I can just tell you at the end of the day, this is something what we, it's, uh, what we get. The way to read it is that uh, this, there is a Poisson here. So there's dot function and there is a Poisson. There, this one is a Poisson weight. And uh, with each Poisson weight at each integer n, you have some complicated distribution. And this distribution is nothing about what we encountered before when you just have this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this distribution from this dot model. So, and there is uh, some rescaling factor. So you, 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 you really don't need to go into the details about this distribution. The only thing I want you to pay attention to is that uh, you have a sum over integers and uh, for large value of a K, uh, each factor, let's say each prefactor in front of these integers is actually highly picked at, uh, at X value, which is uh, integer power is a uh, integer times uh, something. So I think it's best just to show you pictures. This is a picture. Again, it's uh, 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 renormalized by, by, by k. And uh, we pick e to the 2s naught is 4. Why so small? Because uh, otherwise Mathematica takes forever to do the computation. And uh, the feature I want to show you is that as you make k larger and larger, so this green line is k equals 10, yellow 10k equals 100, blue 10k equals 1000. As it makes k larger and larger, it becomes a, a lot of peaks at uh, the value of uh, basically integer value, integer value times uh, some constant. So for large K, the distribution is a, a sum over peaks at uh, equal spacing. And when we find, when we, when we realize this, it's, uh, it confuses us, but it gives us hint that uh, this trace M might be counting something. That's why it's, uh, it's not exact integer values, but it's, uh, it's centered around the integer values. It's, uh, it's funny that it's, uh, let's say, at each integer value, one, two, three, four, five, six, anything, it's uh, smeared, except for the, the peak at zero. It's not smeared. It remains a delta function, which is required because otherwise you'll get negative norm square. So exactly what is this trace M? Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I could only answer this question completely in this really simple model. And by definition, in this simple model, because psi is ij is delta ij, so this trace m actually is the dimension of a Hilbert space of semi-classical states in this theory. So we could uh, see somehow perturbed physics comes back. And uh, in this simple model, uh, trace m is this, and this is a mathematical statement. Again, I will spare you with all the details. I will just explain what is this. This sum over i a i square is uh, 
what we saw before is the, is the distribution with, the, with this dot model. And this Z, okay, again, this is equality between random variables. And this E, Z is the particular random variables with satisfying Poisson statistics, statistics, statistics with certain lambda and the spacing is uh, given by this. So what is Z? We can define the random variable Z by specifying boundary conditions. Let's say Z is given by a pair of circles that are linked. I will explain to you what, what we mean by linked circle. When we compute it, Z is just, uh, you can just uh, fix, let's say if you just have one pair of circles, you just connect them and uh, here's the answer you'll get. When we say linked circles, we mean they have to be connected together. We don't allow just that you're filling a disk or you're filling a disk here. And uh, or Z squared is something like this. And it have contributions of two cylinders or higher topologies like this. But I won't allow you to just connect this or connect this because linked circles, uh, they, how, uh, they, they always do appear together. By this way, I can define a random variable and the claim is that, uh, yeah, the, the, the random trace M is, involves this. So Z, what is this Z? Let, let, let's continue with this Z. This Z is actually the trace of identity operator over certain Hilbert space. The Hilbert space of a two-sided wormholes. The reason is that imagine you consider two-sided wormholes, it has two ends, right? When taking trace, each end of the wormhole will trace out a circle. That's why the boundary condition Z is given by, uh, given by a pair of linked circles. So this Z by definition in, in this simple model is, tra is a trace of identity in this particular Hilbert space. And Z gives the dimension of this Hilbert space. The reason we call it Z is because it's the analog of operator Z in more of Max field model. And let's go back to the quantity we were computing, trace of M, which is a norm square of this uh, uh, unique cosmological state, which is given by this. The first factor, as we already show, is actually the trace of identity in this dot model. The second quantity Z is a trace of identity in this uh, Hilbert space of two-sided wormholes. So together, this is a trace of identity in this model uh, but it's a dot uh, uh, cross wormhole. So in this topological model, the norm square of closed universe state is given by the Hilbert space dimension of this dot cross wormhole model. Again, this is an equality between random variables. So the reason we work hard to figure out this is simply because we find this uh, uh, equal spacing and we get, we get some rough idea that it's counting something, exactly what it's counting, and this, this, is, this, is, uh, this is what we find out. And this theory, this so-called dot uh, times wormhole theory, this theory has a boundary. Its Hilbert space uh, dimension is a well-defined quantity that takes different values in different alpha sectors. And uh, so you can ask what's the, I mean, initially we start from JT plus matter. But then what's the analog of this uh, dot plus wormhole theory in JT plus matter? Let's say we started from a double trumpet. If you cut it open in the middle, you'll get close the universe with a certain size B. Actually, you can cut it the other way. If you cut it through the asymptotic circle, we will have a two-sided wormhole. And this dot cross uh, wormhole theory is nothing about analog of the uh, gravitational theory on, on this uh, two-sided wormhole. Let's say this is another way to write this quantity. And once you write it this way, again, it's in this talk, whenever I write an equation like this, I make sure that it's the equation, it's an equality between random variables. I mean, if you compute all its moments, they will be the same. So now each pair of linked circles will be the analog of this. This capital trace, I mean, it's a trace over two-sided, uh, the, the space, Hilbert space of two-sided wormholes. Uh, however, once you realize that the analog of uh, uh, the JT analog of this quantity is this, uh, it, 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 the, Hilbert, the, interpre the interpretation of Hilbert space dimension no longer holds. So I was a bit disappointed after I realized this, but uh, it is what it is. So the point I wanted to make here is that, uh, let's say we wanted to have a theory of closed the universe. We wanted to have a theory like this. And we have a quantity characterizing this, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, a norm square of a, of a, uh, of a let's say, norm square of, of this state. 
And uh, there is another theory which is related, which is if you cut it this way, then you get a two-sided wormhole theory. The point is that we understand this theory much better than this theory. Why? Because this thing has asymptotic boundary. And now what we see is that there are certain connections between this theory and this theory. The norm square here is some quantities here. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what it is in the case of, uh, let's say, JT plus matter. In a simple topological model, it's just a dimension. So let me give you some summary of non-perturbative non physics we found so far. For closed universes without asymptotic boundaries, the effects of space wormholes give order one corrections to the semi-classical physics. When taking, account, uh, when taking into account space-time wormholes, we find that each alpha sector has only one closed universe state. And in this simple topological model, uh, uh, the norm square of the closed universe state by definition counts the number of orthogonal semi-classical states. In each alpha sector, it also equals to Hilbert space dimension of the underlying theory on a two-sided wormhole. So some future directions. I think there are a lot of questions to, to ask. I will just list a couple of them. There are a lot of things to study about uh, perturbative physics, first of all. I mean, just the relational observables, operator dressing, emergent time symmetry generators, just a lot of things to, to, to work on. And so far, as for non-perturbative physics, so far we only analyzed non-perturbative physics in this simple topological model. And in particular, we find the equality between the normal square of the closed universe state and the Hilbert space dimension of the underlying theory on two-sided wormholes. Can we study the normal square distribution in JT plus matter? Are there any physical interpretation of normal square in general? I mean, it would be very interesting to study this in JT plus matter, but I also expect it to be, to be difficult. I think a naive calculation will just give you infinity. We need to somehow understand the, the, what's going on in the physics there. <coughs> and how does our theory, our story work in theories without ensemble average, like string theory due to super young mills? And there is one big question that bothers us from beginning towards the end. There is stark contrast between semi-classical and non-perturbative physics. And unlike the black hole case, the non-perturbative corrections are large. How do we understand this? Do we still trust the semi-classical physics? And uh, which part of physics is relevant to our observations in cosmology? And uh, yeah, this, I think this is a big question to just, uh, or maybe it just tells us we don't live in a universe like this, this kind of FRW type, type, type universe. But in the center, how to avoid this problem? I, I don't know. Yeah. Then what do all of this teach about? Uh, teach what do all of this teach us about the sitter? That's all I have. Thank you. Um, John. Thanks, Ying. Um, I think this is just my not knowing very much about alpha states, but I was a little confused about how to physically interpret these probability distributions. I understand that they're distributions whose moments are given by the trace m to the k in the model. Yeah, yeah. okay. So I, I, I realize that that's one problem with my talk because I don't have time to review the entire model of Maxfield's story, but at least that's where I sort of, uh, I was based on their framework in the sense that the way I understand it is uh, I understand as uh, different alpha sectors are different theories. And uh, uh, in this uh, winning each fixed theory, the statement is that we need fixed theory. You have a unique uh, cosm uh, cosmological state. In this particular simple model, uh, what we start is actually a special state, which is a hard hawking state. We just uh, start from nothing. Then you add in one boundary, you prepare a state. But uh, the alpha sectors will be much more complicated, will be superpositions with a lot of existing boundaries floating around. And uh, that uh, roughly, yeah. Uh, Maxfield and Mayroff actually had a fog space of closed universes. Yeah. So when you have a, you see, for the black hole, we assume we're studying one space time with the black hole. And if you look at any of them, we think of them as n copies of one. In the Mayroff Maxfield picture, there actually were potentially n closed string universes. And you'd want to apply Bose statistics to the n universes, assuming they're made from bosons. <laughs> and then you cross diagrams. Yeah. Reflect both statistics of the. Universe. Yeah. Are you asking for the statistics? Which. Uh... Not exactly. I'm suggesting a different interpretation of the starting point. Okay. There are, a physical state might have two closed universes. Yeah. 
And then when we take the inner product, the cross diagram arises because they're identical. They're both ones. The physical state has to close the universal. You might have any number. Any number. Yes. Uh, so, in other words, Mayroff and Maxfield had a Fox space of closed universes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. You are, are you saying that instead of we start from one circle, we can construct a state with two circles? Two circles. Not that it's a way to compute the statistics of the inner product of one circle states, but that it's simply a new state. Okay. And then, then it would be clear why the cross diagram that you regarded as a correction is large. It would reflect the both statistics of the universes. So you mean the the, the correction is large because it reflects both on statistics. Well, like the statistics of the universes. You were saying that there are a lot of closed universes. Then they can. Whatever number you know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, right. I'd like to understand a little bit better the connection between what you're what you're doing here and. Um, when you compute the entropy of a black hole using islands, I mean, usually we, we think of this the entropy of the radiation, but it's equal to the entropy of the remaining black hole. And yeah. in the limit where the black hole is fully evaporated, it's like that black hole is like a closed universe and you also get zero. That is true. Um, and, and yet I don't think if you believe there is an interior, we wouldn't want to say that that means there's only one possible interior. I mean, we, we think that that's- But I thought- so. Just from that black hole argument, you would say that it's essentially one state. If we mean one each theory, because if there are different states there, then I mean, then you lose information, right? By, by co collapsing a star in different states, and then it fully evaporate and- You want to say that the material looks different? Is that Whatever the sentence means that there's only one state, I mean, it can, I think there we want it to mean that the information comes out, Yeah. but not that there's actually literally only one possible state in which it comes out. Uh, Semi-classically, of course, they, they, they look quite different. So, uh, but uh, here, what it says that if you take care of this non-perturbative non effect, that's simply one state. One thing I should clarify is that when I make these slides, there are something that I didn't understand until I talk, spoke with Wong yesterday, is that uh, he pointed out to me that uh, the fact that uh, there's a large number of uh, semi-classical states is actually related to the fact that uh, there is a large number of alpha sectors. Uh, and uh, I thought about I thought uh, about it hard. I can only interpret. Uh, uh, I can only show share with you my understanding, but encourage to ask him afterwards. The way I understand it is 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 that uh, let's say in, here we uh, the starting point for us is a hurdle hawking. Let's imagine what if you uh, let's say we, we start from hurdle hawking. We prepare a state like a, we, we prepare a closed circle with the particle one sitting here. Or we can start from different boundary conditions, which is a circle with particle two he is sitting here. And I claim that they are different. In your language is that, uh, let's say, the black holes collapse from a diary and the black hole collapse from a star. They are different. Uh, however, let's look at, uh, let's change the starting point. What if we have start from alpha state? Alpha state, by definition, is uh, the, the eigenstate of uh, the circle with particle one or the circle with part particle two. That means when we add this circle with particle one or a circle with particle two, even though it's not obvious, it's definitely not obvious, but uh, essentially we didn't change the boundary conditions. So at the end of the day, we still get the same closed universe state. But I have to say that that's not obvious at all. Because when I think about that, let's say, even if I think about a complicated superpositions of all these circle states, if I add one of them, then I will increase the minimal number of circles, then it looks like I definitely change the initial conditions. But uh, if alpha state exists, then yeah, you, you don't, they are they're, they're simply the same non-perturbatively. In the case of a black hole interior, yeah. at least many of us hope that it can be understood as you know, some rewriting of the radiation. Yeah. Um, and when you just have a closed universe, <laughs> I don't uh, know. In this it's not case, clear it's... where that you know where that effective emergence of the of the content of the closed universe would come from. In both cases, you get the answer that the entropy is zero. Yeah. Um, and that... But notice in the first half of half of my talk, I was trying to do semi-classical physics. 
I constructed a boundary circle. I constructed the different things in, inside there. I even uh, allow things to, to, to flow around. I even allow light particles to be there. It seems like you can do something like that. But the only problem is just unperturbatively, unpertur if you really want to give an interpretation of a, a Hilbert space quantum mechanics, somehow you end up just finding one state. And uh, I, I myself don't under, understand this. The reason that I changed my talk, the topic of my talk the last minute is because I was so confused and I would like to share my confusion with everyone else. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I have a quick question about the other possible slicing, the one defining a uh, wormhole. Yes, yes. Right. So this is a topological yeah. model, so I guess I don't know how much it makes sense to talk about it, but the idea is that in that case, you would get something like a traversable wormhole in the DS. But oh, it's, yes, yes. It it's, uh, like in this case, you don't have any coupling between the two boundaries. Uh, so what uh, is uh, the uh, uh, Actually, is related to... Uh, So you want to say that is trace over uh, uh, trace over traversable wormhole, uh, trace over uh, traversable wormhole, right? But uh, the question is, the problem is that if you really make a JT analogy of that, what uh, ends up uh, happening is that uh, that quantity is uh, that quantity is. Uh, the analog of this is not just a, a trace over, let's say, traversable wormhole uh, states, which gives you a pure space, space dimension. dimension. You actually have a perturbation like this. That's why I would say the interpretation of pure space dimension will fail in this case. Once you write it down something like this, then you don't, you no longer need to add interactions. Or okay, you can call this an interaction, which is a correlator between two sides. Wait, so what are the possible features. Suppose that I give you one state. I'm yeah. not counting. <laughs> you're just taking one state yeah. with that particular slicing. Yeah. Then it looks like the geometry will look, if you have a, bulk, a consistent bulk, it will look like a traversable wormhole, but yeah. without any coupling between the two. Uh, are you having problem with this geometry? I, okay. Simple question. Is yeah, that I, the solution of uh, the JT with the two sided, with, with two boundaries? And with a correlator there, this is on shell solution. I mean, if you remove this, you can still compute this quantity, but uh, and the SSS did this, you can do an integration over possible uh, size of this, but it just the solution is no longer on shell. Okay. Oh, it's not on shell. Uh, if, you, if you remove this matter, there's no on shell solution, but you can compute its amplitude, it's just no longer on shell solution. Okay. Because the circle in the middle will try to shrink. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. One last question for anyone. If I understand correctly, the, in the, each alpha sector, the trace of M can take continuous values. Yes, I think that's the issue. This is stupid dot model because, uh, yeah. In this model. Uh, we haven't checked that. Donnie did point out to me that uh, uh, if you consider higher powers of certain things, there will be more. <laughs> Actually, I swept something under the rug is that one way when I wrote down this uh, action, uh, my action is uh, simply, let's see. My action is uh, simply this. And actually, there is a potential boundary term. And uh, we just simply set it to zero, but uh, uh, in this model it's perfectly fine. But as you said, if you consider more refined quantities, let, let's say you add end of world brains, you add black hole states, there might be some issues. Yes, but we haven't looked at that. We will do that. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's continue again.